The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, it's Dr. Bill Shaw at the Great Plains Laboratory, and I'm going to be presenting today about Clostridia bacteria and the very important role that they play in autism. So over the last uh, 10 years or so, there's been increasing information about the role of the intestinal tract influencing uh, the brain. And, and I'm going to be talking in a, a great deal about the, the particular group of bacteria that has a, one of the most well-documented uh, influences on the uh, nervous system and the brain. So increasingly, it's thought that the, the microorganisms in the intestinal tract play part of this, what is termed the mind-body microbial continuum. And that these uh, or microorganisms in the intestinal tract can influence the brain, they can influence the uh, peripheral nervous system, and they can influence behavior. Uh, one of the articles from uh, Nature Review showing the brain and the uh, abnormal intestinal flora in the uh, picture at the right having an effect uh, such that the nervous system is stimulated and causes an alteration in a brain function. And uh, one of these is the fact that certain probiotics of the lactobacillus strain regulates emotional behavior and affects the, the receptors for gamma amino butyric acid called GABA uh, in the mouse via the vagus nerve, which is one of the nerves that's connecting the uh, brain to the intestinal tract. So uh, my interest in Clostridia uh, is related to this early research that was done on a chemical that was initially called uh, beta-meta-hydroxyphenylhydroacrylic acid in, in human urine. And I had, in effect, rediscovered this uh, compound uh, nearly uh, 40 years after the, this uh, article was published at the time, I didn't realize that this was the uh, same compound that eventually I termed HPHPA. And, and this article was important because it was observed that mentally ill patients in general, so this means not just one type of mental illness, but people with virtually any kind of mental illness seem to have much higher amounts of this HPHPA than do normal people. But just like many important uh, papers uh, sometimes are, are uh, forgotten, this seemed to be the case with this paper. There was virtually no follow-up after the publication of this paper uh, until I rediscovered this. Of course, when I rediscovered it, I didn't know for a period of years that this was the same compound that was initially discovered by the two researchers, Armstrong and Shaw. And it's kind of interesting. So the uh, Shaw is no relation as far as I know, but it's interesting that both the initial discoverer and the person who rediscovered it is named Shaw. And in 2010, I had completely identified, finally completely identified the uh, molecule that was common in many people with mental illness. Uh, I had found it in, in virtually all kinds of mental illness and it was uh, present and co consistently in patients with autism, and I found one of the highest values uh, ever in a patient with uh, severe schizophrenia. 
and it was published in the journal Nutritional Neuroscience. The compound really had been mostly discovered uh, more than 10 years earlier, but it took a long period of time to chemically identify the complete structure of the molecule. Uh, since my discovery of this, a number of labs throughout the world have confirmed the discovery. So this one in Journal of Immunoassay and Immunochemistry uh, found, again, that, that uh, Clostridia bacteria was associated with autism uh, in children. And the values uh, comparing normal versus autism show that values were significantly elevated in children with autism. And this particular paper came out of Turkey. Uh, then uh, a further uh, discovery was the compound for cresol, which is also produced by a certain species of Clostridia bacteria, was found to be uh, much higher in individuals with autism. And it was also found that uh, those who had the, the highest value uh, had the greatest uh, se severity of autism. And this came out of Italy. And uh, since then, there have been, uh, uh, the discoveries have been repeated in other countries uh, as well. So the Journal of Clinical Microbiology reported identifying uh, Clostridia difficile by detection of the molecule called paracresol. Uh, paracresol is using a particular chemical uh, nomenclature. Uh, there's another nomenclature called UPAC, uh, which is more modern that uses the, the term for Cresol. So at Great Plains Laboratory, we report the uh, compound from Clostridia by the designation of for Cresol. And these are the biochemical structures. So when the molecule was first discovered in the, uh, by, by me in the 1990s, I had like 99% of the structure identified. The only thing that was unidentified was the place where the hydroxyl group was elevated. And this proved difficult because at the time, uh, none of these uh, chemicals were uh, commercially available. And, and uh, so I knew that the compound was a hydroxyphenol, hydroxypropionic acid, but I didn't know the particular position that the hydroxyl group was uh, located. The other chemical that is found uh, just with, mainly with Clostridia difficile is the uh, four cresol. And so chemicals uh, have a particular nomenclature. So for example, here it's uh, position one of the benzene ring, and then two, three, four. So the hydroxyl group is on position four of this phenyl group. And you can see there's a very close similarity in that uh, both of these compounds are have the phenyl group in which there's a, a hydroxyl uh, group added. And it's interesting that both of these molecules have the ability to inhibit a key enzyme that's present both in the brain and the central nervous system called dopamine beta hydroxylase. So one of the things that's very important is that uh, multiple Clostridia species produce the HPHPA and uh, only C. difficile seems to be the producer of the four cresol. In 1995, I published an article about abnormal uh, compounds present in the urine of children uh, with autism. And 
and a number of these were were identified as being from uh, yeast or or fungus. And in addition, there was the HPHPA was also uh, found, and but the exact structure was not indicated at this time. The the biggest clue to uh, where these uh, per, where this particular compound came from was uh, obtained from a psychiatric hospital from uh, for children in the Kansas City area, and I had talked to the laboratory director uh, to see if he'd be willing to uh, provide urine samples from uh, children who had psychiatric problems and with the idea that we could get to the underlying cause. And he said, I have the perfect, uh, I think I have the perfect patient for you. Uh, this patient is not suffering from bad parenting or anything like that. That um, I, I really think there's some biological underpinning that I don't know uh, about, but that's what's causing the child pro the child's problem. He had attention deficit and what was called oppositional defiant disorder, which means he just didn't pay any attention to what the parents or teachers or any other adult was asking him to do. Uh, and and he was tested uh, during this uh, phase and so. Uh, a small increase in this molecule eventually identified as HPHPA. And with the technique of mass spectrometry, you're able to find that a chemical compound is unique uh, without knowing what the structure is because there are certain chemical characteristics that are there even without the knowledge of what the exact structure is. So was able to pinpoint a unique molecule uh, that had some particular chemical characteristics and some particular uh, molecular fragments that made it unique. And the child happened to be hospitalized shortly thereafter and another sample was sent. And when this sample was sent, the child had an absolutely gigantic amount of the molecule HPHPA. And uh, this particular molecule was, was present in such high concentration that most of the other organic acids couldn't uh, be measured. As a matter of fact, I'm convinced that there was so much of this molecule there, it was likely uh, higher than all the other organic acids in the sample combined. So it was a very exciting uh, discovery. The clostridia that produce this compound are, are grow inside the colon. And if a person has a severe infection, uh, they have a condition called colitis. And one of the most common causes of this colitis is the uh, clostridia difficile. So this is a uh, endoscopy of a colon with a person with uh, severe clostridia difficile overgrowth called pseudomembranous colitis. So I want to emphasize that even though clostridia difficile is widely known, um, it's actually one of the, the least abundant uh, clostridia species that are present in, in individuals with autism. Usually they have much higher concentrations of uh, clostridia. So pseudomembranous colitis is uh, one of the terms that's used to treat the, uh, the uh, bacterial overgrowth with clostridia difficile. And here's another case of the pseudomembranous colitis. Pseudo meaning false membrane. So it looks like it's some kind of membrane, but it's really bacteria of the clostridia family. Uh, clostridia uh, organisms have a rod-shaped 
when looked at under the uh, electron microscope, which is one of the most powerful microscopes in existence. And you can see there's a scale here uh, showing uh, five uh, microns and the uh, and uh, w which is at an extremely uh, small size. And this shows a, a larger group of Clostridia bacteria uh, using uh, visualization by the electron microscope. So one of the first scientific papers published was on the use of oral vancomycin for treating uh, autism and 11 children with regressive onset autism were recruited. Regressive onset means that children uh, were beginning to develop normally, and then at some stage in their life, they had a regression. And so these were the, the children that were chosen, and they used oral vancomycin, and they had a psychologist evaluate the children's uh, 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 treatment, what their and, and um, the psychologist uh, actually didn't know the children's treatment, but he was evaluating whether or not there was improvement. And he, he said that eight of the 10 children studied uh, uh, who were treated with vancomycin had an improvement. And the conclusion of the study is that there's a possible gut flora brain connection that warrants further investigation. And of course, uh, this has now been being been looked at in, uh, in, in really about a quarter of a million uh, patients. So species that do produce HPHPA are Clostridia sporogenes, Clostridia botulinum, the same bacteria that causes food poisoning. And of course, it's the same bacteria that produces a protein that uh, people take to make themselves look younger, the, the uh, Botox. Uh, the, there's a Clostridia cal calorie tolerance, Manganati, Goni, and Bifermenta. So there's one, two, three, six species are known that produce HPHPA. So there's many more species that produce HPHPA compared to the uh, Cresol, which is produced by the Clostridia difficile. So most individuals with uh, autism have higher amounts of HPHPA than Cresol, which means that most individuals with autism have are probably colonized with uh, these organisms or perhaps uh, new organisms that haven't been uh, named. And, and the ability to produce uh, these compounds by other species of Clostridia uh, haven't been done. So uh, these are species of Clostridia that don't produce HPHPA. And, uh, and of course, the Cresol is produced by, by the Clostridia difficile. The reason that these Clostridia are important is because the chemicals that they produce inhibit this very important reaction in the uh, central nervous system and in the peripheral nervous system. And this is, they inhibit this key enzyme, dopamine beta hydroxylase. And this is in the pathway uh, in which tyrosine is eventually converted to dopamine and norepinephrine. If there is a deficiency of this particular enzyme because of clostridia, uh, dopamine accumulates so it can't pass the, the, to the next phase because the enzyme is blocked. And so individuals with this problem due to clostridia have elevated dopamine and depressed norepinephrine. So we can analyze dopamine and norepinephrine 
by looking at their metabolic byproducts. The metabolic byproduct of dopamine is called HVA, the abbreviation for homovanillic acid. And this can be checked in the organic acid test. The byproducts of norepinephrine and epinephrine is the same product called VMA, which the long name is vanillyl mandelic acid. So with the organic acid test, we can test for the uh, products of Clostridia bacteria, the 4-Cresol, the HPHPA, but we can also measure the, the abnormalities in the catecholamines. This is what these products are called, norepinephrine and epinephrine and dopamine are all called catecholamines. And, and so we can, so in addition to measuring clostridia, we can measure the neurotransmitters uh, that are produced, and we can know when the metabolism of these neurotransmitters is uh, deranged. The, the uh, catabolism of dopamine uh, can work either by the, can be broken down in two, pathways, one starting with monoamine oxidase, MAO, or by catechol O-methyl transferase. But regardless of which way uh, it begins, the final byproduct is called homovanillic acid or HVA. So HVA is a very good marker for uh, dopamine. And one of the most important scientific papers about autism was one that was published in a Belgian uh, psychiatric journal in 1980. And in my opinion, this article didn't get nearly enough uh, attention. Uh, and, and the most important thing about this article was that it found that individuals with autism had much higher values of the dopamine metabolite HVA compared to normal children. Here's the normal results. There's just one of the individuals in the normal range that was um, th th that was elevated, and perhaps perhaps this wasn't true. Maybe the person in this normal range really had some particular problem. But in any case, the average value in the uh, was much lower in normal individuals compared to those with uh, autism. And the other thing that was extremely important is that the, the uh, persons with autism, the severity of their behavior was related to how high the dopamine uh, was elevated. So the more elevated the dopamine the, the greater the severity of autistic symptoms. And so the question was, why? Why was the dopamine high? And, and so uh, the big breakthrough with the clostridia is that it was able to now say why the dopamine was high. And it was because of these clostridia bacteria and the scientific literature proves this. They took 4-Cresol uh, and other uh, chemicals um, that were produced by Clostridia bacteria, and they found that the 4-Clostridia, the major Clostridia difficile metabolite, was a very strong inhibitor of dopamine uh, beta hydroxylase. So this is a, a, a very important uh, scientific finding, and they actually found that not only is it an inhibitor, but that the 4-Cresol, which they're calling paracresol, is actually covalently bonded to one of the tyrosine uh, amino acids that are in the dopamine beta-hydroxylase enzyme. So, uh, this diagram is really a summary of, of uh, all the uh, particular 
uh, metabolism of both the microorganism and the human. So this is perhaps one of the perhaps the first or one of the first diagrams showing the integration of bacterial metabolism with human metabolism. So bacteria have the, of different of different clostridia uh, can convert tyrosine or phenylalanine to HPHPA or to cresol, uh, and the uh, tyrosine in the human is converted to dopa and then dopamine. And if the bacteria from the clostridia is high, it prevents the conversion of dopamine to norepinephrine, resulting in an uh, increase in the dopamine metabolite and a depression in the norepinephrine. So why is dopamine a problem? Well, first of all, many of you may have already had the experience if your child is severely affected that they may have recommended that you use a drug called Risperdal uh, to treat your child if they had severe, if they had severely abnormal behavior. The reason for this is Risperdal blocks the effects of excessive dopamine. The thing is, uh, the Risperdal doesn't get to what the underlying problem is, which is excessive Clostridia bacteria. So for those of you who are parents, it's important to realize if your physician has recommended uh, one of these neuroleptic drugs like Risperdal, it means the chances are excellent that your child has this clostridia problem and that's what causing the excess dopamine. And if you're able to treat this, your child won't need Risperdal. Unfortunately, Risperdal causes all kinds of, of uh, abnormal side effects like uh, uh, abnormal movements it can, and it can cause obesity and it can also cause boys to develop breasts. So these are all undesirable side effects which can be avoided if you find out that the reason your child has excess dopamine is because they have the clostridia problem. So, uh, so the excessive dopamine is a problem because uh, dopamine degradation results in the production of oxidative species that can have toxic effects on the brain in the peripheral nervous system. So most dopamine is stored in, in, uh, in these vesicles, uh, and which are like little bags or of uh, neurotransmitters, and and the dopamine doesn't break down and degrade when it's stored in these uh, what are called synaptic vesicles. Um, however, that when the dopamine values get too high, it leaks out of these vesicles and dopamine becomes toxic. So cytosolic dopamine undergoes degradation to HVA, but also forms extremely toxic dopamine metabolites and oxidative species, which deplete the brain of glutathione. And this is very important because glutathione helps to keep the right oxidative uh, stress level in the brain uh, in a proper phase. And the uh, excess dopamine forms these, what are called uh, dopamine quinone. The dopamine quinone is then converted to, to uh, cyclized dopamine semiquinone. And the semiquinone then has the ability to react with oxygen to form oxygen superoxide free radical, which then causes brain damage. So the longer the child has this problem, the greater the chance it, the chances are that there is going to be some uh, uh, brain uh, damage unless it unless it is treated. So it's extremely important to have 
the this kind of testing done in the child as um, the younger they are when when tested and treated the better uh, so a group in in um, in uh, Chile Santiago Chile has been doing extensive work on the toxicity of dopamine so dopamine has the ability to this particular dopamine metabolite is called aminochrome and the aminochrome can attack the mitochondria and and cause damage to the parts of the mitochondria that make energy so there are different complexes in the electron transport chain of the mitochondria and two of these are attacked by this dopamine metabolite aminochrome in addition the aminochrome attacks a key enzyme in the Krebs cycle of the mitochondria called isocitrate dehydrogenase and then in addition the aminochrome also reacts with structural elements of the brain and the axon so that the structure of the uh, nerve cell is um, disturbed. So all of these things lead to uh, nerve cells that have broken down structures and to mitochondria that don't function well and don't produce adequate energy. And this is a big problem, especially for the brain, because the brain requires more energy than any other organ, especially in humans, which have the uh, one of the largest brains per body weight of any animal. So the consequences of this excessive dopamine is that it leads to overstimulation of nerves that are that are activated by uh, dopamine and and it also may lead to substitution of dopamine into norepinephrine uh, areas of the brain and this and the sympathetic nervous system so if a part of the brain was normally uh, regulated and stimulated by norepinephrine um, by excuse me was stimulated by dopamine uh, if there's too much um, uh, too much dopamine produced, then, then uh, norepinephrine is blocked from working or there's not adequate amounts of norepinephrine. And so dopamine, a abnormal neurotransmitter for certain nerves, is, is uh, produced instead. So in addition, as was just shown on the previous slide, there's excess dopamine is causing oxidative damage to the mitochondria uh, and to the proteins in the nerve cells. And it also causes a depletion of glutathione, which is a antioxidant, and, but it's also the, the, the supplement in the brain that's involved in detoxification of hundreds of other toxic chemicals as well. The, uh, the areas of the brain producing uh, dopamine, this uh, ventral tegmental area, and the substantia nigra. Substantia migra nigra is the uh, Latin word for black substance. So in the, uh, there, so there's so much dopamine in the normal brain that the, that the area is, develops a black uh, color. For the individual who develops Parkinson's disease, um, that area is sometimes lost. So we've seen several cases of extremely severe autism in which we monitored both the HPHPA, which is the chemical from Clostridia, and it's designated uh, over, uh, here, the, um, the clostridia is indicated in the blue dashed line. And the amount of dopamine metabolite is in the, um, the solid red line. So it's amazing that these graphs are completely uh, 
uh, coincidental. They follow each other exactly, uh, to, to my mind, indicating the, uh, the, that this has additional proof that the chemical from clostridia is causing uh, the increase in dopamine. It would be, if this was just an accident, there, there would not be uh, an exact uh, up and down exactly following the same pattern for these two different molecules. So these patterns are the same because the clostridia is causing the high dopamine. When clostridia goes way down, the amount of dopamine goes way down. So this is a case of one of the mo some of the most severe cases of autism, which in addition to regular autistic features, the child even had difficulties with some of the uh, motor uh, movements as well. And this shows a second patient, again, with severe autism, again, showing that the very high amounts of dopamine in red are associated with the high amounts of the clostridia. So the norepinephrine, in addition to uh, and dop norepinephrine and dopamine being involved in the brain, norepinephrine is also derived in what is called the peripheral nervous system. The part that's called the sympathetic nervous system is involved with activities like dilating the pupils, uh, inhibiting the flow of saliva, accelerating the heartbeat, uh, dilating, which means opening up the uh, lungs, inhibiting peristalsis, which is the uh, squeezing of the uh, digestive tract. So all of these different functions are, are uh, a uh, work by the action of norepinephrine. However, if the high amounts of clostridia are there, the the adrenal gland, which normally makes adrenaline and noradrenaline, uh, or, or sometimes called epinephrine and norepinephrine, uh, won't function. And so there, there won't be uh, adequate adrenaline. Uh, so if the person is under a stressful situation, the normal reaction would be to produce adrenaline. But in the individual who has really severe clostridia, even the ability to make adrenaline would be uh, inhibited. So uh, clostridia is uh, very common in uh, children under two years old. This is some data from uh, Poland uh, looking at children under two years of age. And they were looking for toxin of uh, clostridia dif difficile. So one of the things that's very important to know is that many labs that test for clostridia only look for this toxin, but the ability to make the toxin or to make the cresol are separate, uh, are separate things. So the person could have be negative for toxin, but positive for, uh, for cresol or vice versa. Uh, so they use the what is called polymerase chain reaction, in which they're looking at the the uh, DNA and then <coughs> measuring the uh, susceptibility to uh, antimicrobials. And they found that uh, over two thirds of the children were affected with Clostridia difficile. One of the good things is they found that all of these strains could be killed by some of the most common antibiotics used for clostridia, which are vancomycin or metronidazole. Metronidazole also is sometimes called flagyl. Well, what are some of the properties of clostridia bacteria? So they're strict anaerobes. They die when exposed to uh, oxygen. Uh, members of this genus uh, cause tetanus, diarrhea, and uh, food poisoning called botulism. These spores are highly resistant to heat and antibiotics. There are about 100 different species of clostridia in the gastrointestinal tract, but many of these still don't even have 
a species name. Uh, but they can be controlled by vancomycin or metronidazole uh, and by uh, lactobacillus acidophilus. Uh, sometimes the, the, uh, there are certain uh, other probiotics that are even more effective. One of the ones that I've been recommending lately is called Corebiotic, and it's available from uh, new beginnings. Uh, the, pr the property that makes the Clostridia hard to treat is the fact that they produce these spores, and these spores are not killed by the antibiotic. These spores look like little uh, mini uh, tennis rackets, and they're very uh, uh, difficult to kill by heat, and they're, and they're not killed by uh, antibiotics. So the spore formation makes the, these organisms some of the most difficult microorganisms to control. As some people have had as many as 20 recurrences after the use of these antibiotics. And these alcohol hand wipes that they have in the visiting rooms in the hospital uh, have no effect on these spores. They're not killed at all by these uh, hand wipes, and they may actually help the spores uh, to spread in the hospital. This is one of the most common uh, problems in the hospital is, is uh, people become infected with the clostridia. Uh, only bleach is the only thing that uh, kills the spores, and this is probably the reason why there was this popular a uh, chemical called MMS that was used for uh, uh, by some people uh, without really knowing why, but I, I take it that the reason was because this MMS was really just a form of bleach. Uh, however, this can cause the mucosa damage, can cause intestinal bleeding. In one case in which I'm familiar, there was even a uh, intestinal cancer that occurred shortly after the use of the MMS. So this is not my favorite thing, uh, but the, it, it likely may have caused uh, some benefit to the people who, uh, who, who used it. But to me, it's, uh, it's the, the uh, side effects from its use are much too severe, and I would not recommend it. So th this graph shows spores very well in a, a person with autism. They started out with a baseline with very high HPHPA, uh, started taking the flagell metronidazole, and after uh, 20 days, there was there, the amount of the uh, clostridia marker was down to zero. At this point, the metronidazole was stopped, and then what you see, and that within another 20 days, there's the uh, clostridia has come back. The marker has co uh, come again, and this is the big problem with clostridia, which is the recurrence. So this is a, a very good title for one of the scientific articles dealing with treatments for uh, Clostridia difficile with the title, What Really Works? from the Journal of Medical Microbiology. And it was found that uh, there was uh, a, a nice graph showing that, that using 10 days in a row, uh, about half of the individuals would develop a recurrence. But by using what is called this pulsing technique, uh, the, the vancomycin was given as a dose of 125 uh, to 500 uh, uh, milligrams, uh, and, but it was only given uh, at this dose once every three days. So the benefit of this is that 
the antibiotic would kill the active cells uh, and then there would be two days without antibiotics and in those two days without the antibiotic the clostridia spores would then germinate and then when the next dose was given on the fourth day the 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 spores in effect were killed and so by doing this for about a month uh, the percent of recurrences went from 50 percent to about five percent so there's about a tenfold improvement in the treatment of clostridia by using this pulsing technique remember the pulsing technique is one day on the antibiotic and then two days without it and then repeat that for about 10 cycles uh, so this this was data based on treatment with vancomycin but i'd say it's probably likely that the similar treatment using metronidazole would would also work but but it's not been documented in the medical literature so there are many other conditions that may be affected by the clostridia so we've seen that virtually every psychiatric illness um, may be affected so this is a case of a 44 year old woman severe anorexia nervosa a condition in which the person has the abnormal perception that they're obese and so they refuse food for long periods of time. For a long time, I think the thinking was this is some kind of uh, psychological thing, but with biochemical testing, we've now seen a number of cases of anorexia nervosa where the clostridium metabolite was extremely high and, and using the organic acid test, you can see that the uh, dopamine value was extremely high because the HPHPA is preventing the conversion of dopamine to norepinephrine. And you see the uh, norepinephrine metabolite VMA is very low. So the ratio is extremely abnormal. The normal ratio is about one. The ratio in this patient with uh, anorexia nervosa is 26. So, so my take on what is the cause of anorexia nervosa is that the person with clostridia um, is, re would react very badly to any food containing protein. And so what happens when the person eats protein, the protein is converted to to the HPHPA or Cresol, these molecules then cause extremely abnormal behavior and in that the person is avoiding food uh, uh, perhaps mainly because of their perception that their brain is not functioning at all because of the uh, overproduction of dopamine when they have the clostridia. So every time somebody eats, they get a new supply of, of the uh, phenylalanine and tyrosine, which is then converted to these toxic bacterial metabolites and causes the brain to malfunction. Uh, in addition, this graph is very important because it shows that the uh, pyroglutamic acid is uh, very elevated in the uh, in this particular patient, which is an indication of glutathione deficiency. So the person is producing uh, so much of these toxic uh, dopamine products that the dopamine is using up glutathione. Uh, so here is a uh, a case of the um, the same woman and looking at the uh, high amounts of yeast and fungal metabolites as well. So, so for the person who has the yeast and fungus, carbohydrates uh, build up and cause toxicity due to the mold and fungus in the intestinal tract. So 
for the person who has the uh, both times of abnormal organisms in the intestinal tract, uh, either carbohydrates or proteins uh, cause a overgrowth of these toxic microorganisms uh, leading, to, uh, uh, leading to the person not wanting to eat because any kind of food is causing an overproduction of these toxic uh, chemicals from microorganisms. This is an example of a person with mental retardation. And again, they have high, uh, very high amounts of the dopamine metabolite. And the ratio of HVA to VMA is five to one, where the normal should be one to one. And again, they have high amounts of clostridia. Uh, this is a person with uh, the diagnosis of schizoid behavior, meaning they don't have schizophrenia, but they have some of the abnormalities of patients with uh, schizophrenia. And the person has very high amounts of the HPHPA and uh, very high amounts of the uh, dopamine metabolites. And again, the indicator of glutathione deficiency is very abnormal. Uh, Parkinson's disease, another case with uh, extremely high amounts of both type of clostridia bacteria, the HPHPA and the Cresol, uh, again, a very abnormal ratio between the HVA and VMA. Uh, this is a 65-year-old um, uh, person uh, and let me let me go back. A 65-year-old person with high uh, cresol, the the C diff, and there again is a very high dopamine metabolite with a high ratio. The person has both um, uh, depression and uh, irritable bowel, and following the treatment, both the depression and the the um, both the depression and the bowel symptoms improve. Uh, here's a six-year-old female with severe aggression and odd uh, behavior, perhaps on the autistic spectrum, and the patient has uh, very high amounts of the HPHPA. What's also interesting, of course, on this one is they also have high markers for the, for the uh, mold metabolites. These are the metabolites of, of a person with, um, with Aspergillus. Uh, and Dr. Baker recently found that a, uh, one of the most rapid uh, reversals of autism by treating uh, with uh, very potent uh, antifungal drugs and controlling the aspergillus. Uh, this is one of the first cases of autism that was treated with uh, both nystatin and high amounts of probiotics, in this case, the lactobacillus acidophilus, and the treatment re resulted in a marked improvement in the clostridia as well as the markers for uh, yeast and fungus. A marked improvement in, in uh, schizophrenia was found in a, uh, in a young woman. She was a psychiatrist's daughter who began to have acute uh, psychosis with auditory hallucinations. She was treated just with the uh, antibiotics, no no uh, Risperdal or any of the antipsychotic drugs, and had a, a complete remission of symptoms after uh, putting the HPHPA under control. Uh, also have found this in uh, chronic fatigue. So this was a woman who was bedridden uh, with severe fatigue at extremely high HPHPA value. And then after treatment, the value dropped very low. All the depression and fatigue were resolved. 
so these are the like standard treatments uh, for Clostridia. And what I'm recommending is not the standard treatment, but the pulsing treatment. But I just want to tell you what the standard treatment is. So vancomycin is given orally, not intravenously. So if you go to get a prescription for this, you, uh, you need to make sure that your doctor knows that you want an oral administration, not an intravenous one. Uh, so the common dosing is five to 10 milligrams per kilogram of body weight per day, divided into three doses for 10 days. So if you were doing the pulsing method, you would use the same uh, uh, dosing but then you would have two days off and then repeat this dose again. And then the uh, same thing, Flagyl is the most common dosing schedule is 10 days, but could likely be uh, put into the pulsing method. So the regular dose, 30 milligrams per kilogram per day, divided into three doses. Uh, Lactobacillus acidophilus can be used. Saccharomyces boulardii can be used, uh, VSL number three, and one of, as I mentioned, one of the uh, newer probiotics that, to my mind, has been most effective is called the core biotic. Uh, you may also need additional glutathione because the neurotoxic dopamine has used up most of the uh, glutathione, and it's also very important to notice that you should not be using a high protein diet or giving uh, amino acid supplements before the clostridia is treated. Otherwise, the phenylalanine and tyrosine will be just be converted to excessive dopamine that will cause, again, even more abnormal behavior. Uh, Metronidazole or flagyl does have some side effects uh, and uh, some of them can be severe, but they're relatively rare and they seem that most of them will stop if you have side effects. Most of them stop when the drug is discontinued. Um, th this is from my article in 2010 in nutritional neurosciences showing uh, low amounts of um, uh, clostridia uh, bacteria in infants and boys and very high amount, um, uh, excuse me, low amounts in, in normal boys and infants, but very high values in autistic boys, similar results in girls as well. The results were statistically uh, significant, and uh, the HPH values in two-thirds of the children with autism exceeded control mean and median values. So it's a very important aspect, one of the most important aspects in autism. Um, the comparison to other tests. So if you just do neurotransmitters, neurotransmitter tests don't give clostridia markers. And so if the, if the neurotransmitters are elevated, you don't know what the reason for it is. Uh, you really need the organic acid test to get both the, the neurotransmitters and the clostridia markers. Um, many clostridia are beneficial bacteria so stool testing may give erroneous results. Most stool tests just give clostridia as a group. They don't break it down into whether it's good, bad, or indifferent. So to my mind, stool testing is for clostridia is not beneficial. Uh, the, the Great Plains organic acid test gives information on HPHPA, on Cresol, and on neurotransmitters. Uh, so this is a, a, a child with, uh, uh, with autism and, and has uh, very high amounts of uh, clostridia compounds. Uh, DNA testing can sometimes be, give inaccurate results. 
Uh, so here you see an example where the child with clostridia had high amounts of HPHPA, yet the DNA test was showing low. Uh, factors involved in, in, um, in uh, autism are all included on the organic acid test, the HVA, the major dopamine metabolite, VMA, the major metabolite of norepinephrine and epinephrine, the 4-hydroxyphenylacetic acid, another compound produced by clostridia, it, and is also an inhibitor of the dopamine uh, beta-hydroxylase, the HVA-VMA ratio, which is a good indicator that the that the clostridia is causing an inhibition of the key enzyme, dopamine beta hydroxylase, and there's also vitamin B6 is measured directly, which is a cofactor needed for the production of uh, dopamine. Pyroglutamic acid is a good marker for glutathione deficiency, and the two different clost clostridia markers uh, are also included. So the, uh, this particular test with its group of metabolites is good for virtually all the psychiatric conditions and has been use useful for schizophrenia, psychosis, depression, chronic fatigue, tics and Tourette syndrome, autism, Parkinson's disease, arthritis, ADD, ADHD, obsessive compulsive disorder, seizure disorder, irritable bowel, Crohn's disease, and ulcerative colitis. So thank you all very much. And I think you'll find this information extremely helpful.